Hello, Alex. How are you doing, mate? Hey, man. Really good. Good, man. Good, man. So how are we doing? Are you excited to get in there and fight? Yeah, yeah, definitely the uh, the, the highest profile opponent I've ever, I'll have ever had. Plus, uh, you know, a win just really opens up a, a lot of opportunities for bigger fights and really kind of cements myself in my career. So this, this is a big opportunity. I'm looking to make the most out of it. Yeah, so obviously you're fighting Anthony Pettis this weekend. Uh, 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 Stephen Wonderboy Thompson against Jeff Neal card. It's going to be a, an amazing opportunity for you because, like you just said, it's the biggest name that you've you've had the opportunity to be in the octagon with. <clears throat> and obviously, you not a lot of people might not remember, but you actually fought last month. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, man, it was nice. You know, I got the 15 minutes experience. You know, set a pretty high pace in that fight. I actually set a, a, a personal record in uh, significant strikes landed, and, uh, and and really had no damage out of it whatsoever. I took my two weeks off, especially over Thanksgiving, which was really nice to kind of hang out with the family and have some like more forced time out of the gym. And, and, you know, after that two week break, I had planned on kind of going back into not necessarily fight camp, but like fight camp mode in terms of like hitting two a days and, uh, and just really cleaning up the diet. And sure enough, you know, I started that Monday, Tuesday, I get the call right back in. And I had two pretty hard weeks of training. I didn't take a single day off and I was planning on the kind of like resting and recovering on fight week and, and everything just worked out so well. I was peaking at the right times. You know, I had such a good foundation from being in shape on the last fight. It was a, it was a perfect storm, man. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, how many weeks away was it from the fight you actually got the call? Uh, I, I think everything, you know, I fought. Two weeks later, I got the call. Then three weeks later was the fight. So, you know, it, was, yeah. it, was all, it was thankfully such a short amount of time. There was no, you know, overanalyzing anything. I had the perfect amount of time to rest and then get right back on it while not losing any any progress from the last fight camp uh, again man the timing really couldn't have been better yeah and of course if you if you look at it in the right mindset you could like you said in your last fight you came out with no no damage really so that's part of training for the next fight so it rolls on to the next one and the momentum just keeps building yeah i'll tell you psychologically and physically you know like the eight week long fight camps they're <laughs> fun but they're taxing especially mm. like the final two weeks and uh, and i didn't i didn't even get close to like wanting to be done with the training. Cause like, you know, the more I do this, I, I tend to peak earlier and earlier in terms of just like timing and, and cardio. And, uh, and you know, when I, when I was training for Reese, it was an eight week fight camp and right around week six, I felt that peak, which is good. You know, it's cool to happen early, but then you got to maintain it. That's where, that's where things can be difficult. And on this one, you know, right after my first week kind of shaking off, you know, the diet change and the workload, you know, week two, I was really feeling sharp. And then week three is fight week. You know, so I, I, so I feel like I peaked perfectly and it's easy to keep. And it's just, it's just again, like the timing, you know, the, the perfection of the storm was really nice. But, you know, getting the fight, feeling good, that's not the hard part. Winning the fight, that's, that's, what, that's what's going to take the most focus and effort. And that's certainly not the uh, aspect I'm looking past. Yeah, definitely. And then obviously we know whatever happens in the fight happens, but as long as you put your heart and soul and everything you can into training and you know you've come prepared, obviously, if you lose, you lose. You know the better man won that night. But if you're prepared and you're mentally prepared, everything's good on your side. Do you know what I mean? That's right. I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm telling you, in these fights, and I feel like this psychological advantage has, has helped me in the higher level, but like I am willing to die to win this fight, and, uh, and I can't wait to go put it out there. And the beauty of MMA is, you know, no one really ever dies. It's a... It's kind of like a, a taste of immortality, you know, in a sense. But uh, it's it's fun, man. I, I enjoy the pressure of like the decision making, and, and I'm up for that task for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that high pressure decision making that is like it's on another level. I think you can't ever, you can't really get in any other walk of life without doing what you're doing. No, not without like more extreme physical consequences. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the only reason I ever you know trained as much as I did and then competed was because the training i enjoyed the the decision making with physical consequences just doing jujitsu doing kickboxing and uh and you know it's it's just the troubleshooting you know learning from mistakes it's just it's so fun it just keeps you sharp and it's one of those things that never gets old and it's always changing it's cool yeah that's what a lot of people say about like for jujitsu for example that like it also like makes you have the mindset of you have to grow every day sort of thing because it you always have something in jiu-jitsu you need to grow on. So you go in one day and it might be this, but the next day is something completely new. And then you've got to keep every day adapting and changing and growing. So it's like you can implement that into your daily life with everything. 
Yeah, it's cool. You know, you know, there's like a saying that's like, you know, when, it's when you get your black belt is when you really start your, your jujitsu. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, before I was a black belt, I was like, man, that's crazy. I've been doing this for, you know, eight years every day, twice a day. But then when I got my black belt, I kind of understand when you catch a black belt, you've pretty much like been exposed to most of the techniques and positions. And then I, I just got my second degree uh, a few weeks ago, actually. So six years as a black belt. And I understand now, like you see the same routes, the same escape reactions, escape, the same <laughs> offensive openings. And like what the black belt does is it gives you a baseline to create these new routes from. And I just, I feel so seasoned as a grappler, you know, so much so to where when I compete, I like to kickbox more because I feel like I, I still have like, like more to learn. That's a, a more, a more daunting aspect of a fight game, especially in MMA is banging it out with the four-ounce gloves. That's why I prefer to strike more than anything else. Yeah, it's funny because if you go on like your ESPN like uh, page on the internet or something, it will say your style is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But if you watch the last couple of fights, like you said, you're, you're a stand and bang guy and you're good at it as well. Yeah, if you, if you watch any of my UFC fights, you know, like, the, mm -hmm. you know, I, I caught a submission on Josh Berkman, but I cracked him with the hook and he shot in, gave me the guillotine. Uh, same thing, like when I beat Zach Otto, I hurt him with a spinning back kick, and it made him shoot in into a guillotine, mm -hmm. and then I swept him in the mount. He kind of rolled to his back to not get choked. So I didn't really initiate any of these exchanges. It was just like, you know, I always made the joke, I do so much jujitsu, so it allows me to strike comfortably in the fight. So if guys take me down, you know, I got a, I got a really comfortable avenue. And, uh, and, you know, as I've done that over the you know, years, 20 plus fights, I feel like uh, I'm a more decorated striker than I am grappler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it definitely helps having that in the back of your mind to know that you haven't got to be necessarily worried about going on the floor because you know you can handle yourself there as well. Yeah. And uh, you were saying before we got on uh, that you've got a teammate fighting on this card as well. So you've got uh, Jeff Neal. And is there anyone else that's fighting on the card? Just your teammates? You know, we started with four, and, uh, and, and you know, we're, we're down to Jeff and I, which honestly, like, like it would have been cool to have everyone on the team on the card, but mm -hmm. in terms of, like, the, the team's resources and, uh, and like, you know, tasks, mm -hmm. they've certainly become lower. But I know Ryan Spann was supposed to fight Misha Serkinov. Man, that was a phenomenal fight because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Misha is a great grappler, but so is Ryan Spann. I didn't realize we were kind of joking at the gym on who has the better guillotine, and he's got, like, almost 10 guillotine subs. I didn't know so many. So, man, I, 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 I thought his jiu-jitsu would neutralize Misha and, and Span would be the better striker and wrestler. But uh, I know Misha had a – I think he tore his hamstring or pulled it. I don't know. I don't know the details, but he had to pull out. Mm -hmm. So, I know Span's looking to fight a little bit later next year. And then I know Matt Chanel. He's kind of a newer addition to Ford. I trained with him a bit in Houston. He thankfully made the smart move to come down. He was supposed to fight Tyson Nam, but Tyson Nam suffered a cut in training. So they actually rebooked their fight to, uh, to mid-January in Fight Island. So it is just Jeff and I. You know, last I know, I was going to open up the main card against Pettis, and Jeff naturally is the main event. And uh, so it's really cool. It's really cool to be on the main card of a, of a fight night that a teammate is headlining against a guy in Wonderboy. You know, it's just mm -hmm. a lot of very, you know, respectable fighters on this card. I was telling my, my striking coach, I was like, man, this is the most immersed in a UFC event we could ever hope to be. And, you know, as, as teenagers who are, you know, still fighting amateur, uh, we just never would have known we'd have been here. It's really cool. It's very uh, humbling, and, uh, and I'm very grateful to be in this position. Yeah, it's definitely great. And I don't know how much of a, a fight fan you are in, in terms of, like, watching fights when you're not fighting and that sort of thing. Is that, like, is that something you do? That's all I do, man. I, yeah. I, you know, when I'm, not, when I'm not training, I'm at home watching fights. It was funny. I was making the joke last week. You know, on Saturday, there was the, the UFC 256. And uh, on my TV, I had the UFC fights on. On my, my iPod, on my iPad, I had uh, the Fight TV app. There were some local fights. Fury Fighting Championship was on. And then on my phone, we had a, we had a few of our students do a jiu-jitsu tournament. So I had three combat sports going on at the same time. But, I mean, it's, I, I watch fights probably as much as a lot of you guys, the interviewers. That's why I'm so happy to do these interviews. It's cool to have um, mutual fight fans because, you know, without the fans like you and myself, there's no fights. Yeah. So I feel like I get to kind of pull, like, triple duty. I'm a coach, I'm a fighter, and I'm a fan. And it just, it makes it all, you know, so easy, so much yeah. fun. Yeah, of course. It's never, never feels like work or feels like you have to do something if it feels like fun, does it? So, but I was going to say, like, if, as a, as a fight fan, this card coming up, it, it looks amazing from top to bottom. Dynamite. You know, the fights I'm really looking forward to, Jose Aldo versus Cheeto Vera. I mean, mm -hmm. 
you can't ask for a better fight. Marlon Moraes is always fun to watch. Even his fight against San Hagen was great. His fight against Cejudo was great. I know, he, I know he didn't win those ones, but still really entertaining. And he's fighting mm -hmm. Rob Font. Yeah. I don't know Rob Font's not as high profile, but I've been, I've been a big fan of Rob Font's skill set for a while. Anytime I'm teaching a striking class, I use his jab against Ricky Simone as a great example of a good, accurate, active jab. The way he can put his, his striking with his wrestling together is great. Uh, you know, Chaos Williams versus Michelle Pierre, that's a scrap. That's a mm -hmm. wild fight. I mean, you, I, you know what fight I was really looking forward to was Bilal Muhammad versus Diego Lima. Mm -hmm. And that one just got scratched yesterday, which was a bit of a bummer. Uh, but uh, there's some other heavy hitters on the card, too. You know, Jimmy Flick, I know he's, he's, he's been in, like, the, the, the southern Texas region. You know, he's fighting uh, Cody Durden, which is yeah. a cool fight. And there's that Carl Roberson guy. I know he's a heavy hitter. I know there's a guy from the Contender Series, I believe in 85, or I forget his name. It's a bit harder to pronounce. But it's, it's a good fight all around. Or it's a good fight card. I mean, it's a dynamite yeah. fight card. I was so happy to not only get on the card, but to fight Pettis, like being one of the probably four most prolific fights on the card. I'm very mm -hmm. happy. Very happy to have this opportunity. Yeah. And what do you think of uh, Anthony Pettis as an opponent? You know what? I've always been the kind of a fighter to, to almost overhype my opponents. So when the fight is happening, if the fight's difficult, which I plan it to be, it's like that's going to game plan. But if I'm having a lot of success, I'm like, yes, it's going better than I was planning. Whereas I know a lot of guys, they'll almost like downplay fighters to give themselves like a psychological advantage. But I think that's a mistake because if the fight is showing some hardship, sometimes it'll cause guys to break. And I plan on the opposite. Like, I plan on the fight being hard as all hell and, uh, and having to come through some adversity. So I'm planning for the absolute best, Anthony Pettis. And, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I know he's going to bring it. And I'm going to fight that fire with fire. Mm -hmm. And obviously, not having uh, necessarily a full camp for, for this one, what sort of things have you done to prepare for the sort of unorth unorthodox striking that he has and the weird striking that he does? You know, people are happy to emulate Pettis. Uh, when, when he fought my teammate, Carlos Diego Fiera, you know, I had made the trip to Dallas to, to emulate Pettis as well as I do have my Taekwondo black belt. So does my striking coach. So like when we need to pull out some flashy stuff, we can. And it's just fun to do. You know, I, one of my main training partners at home, uh, he's seven and two as a pro. But they call him the grinder. He's a wrestler. But even when we were training, like he was throwing cartwheel kicks. <laughs> you know, we were having so much fun. And, uh, and, you know, Pettis is a vet. He's got a lot of submissions. I would not be surprised if he looked to wrestle or grapple. Uh, you know, we're, we're planning on him to strike. Mm -hmm. That's what everyone's doing. But, I, but I'm expecting, you know, the script to be different. And with this fight, I wasn't doing a lot of specific planning. I mean, obviously, the, the, big, the big strikes you got to be conscious of. But uh, I'm putting no restrictions on what can happen in this fight. And I'm going to really try to go in a free-formed fighter and, uh, and just kind of go with the flow and, and, and win everywhere I can win. Yeah, definitely. And I've just seen uh, a bit earlier that it was 10 years today since that uh, Showtime kick. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, you know, I remember being, what, 19 or 20 years old, watching that live and thinking that was the coolest thing ever. And, uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, after that fight, Pettis goes to the UFC and he fights Clay Guida and, uh, and then ended up losing the decision. So mm -hmm. I, I know just... But then he ended up becoming champ, and then uh, and and then and then losing the belt, you know. So he's had such a such a career. It was just cool. But I I have certainly followed his career, you know, as a martial artist and honestly as a fight fan. So uh, there wasn't a lot of excessive studying to do. You kind of know what you get with them, mm -hmm. and uh, and and that's like an aspect. I don't want them to assume that we're falling into that same lull. And uh, so you know, if I, I'm I'm expecting you know, classic Pettis, but I'm also kind of expecting something new. So again, just kind of going in there with an open mind and, and being a veteran much like himself is a, is a good idea. Yeah, because obviously in the UFC, you both actually got quite a lot of experience because you've been in the UFC since 2015. I think you've got a record of seven and three with one no contest. And he's yeah. obviously been there, I think, since 2011. And he's got a, a record of something like 10 wins. 10 and, and, nine, 10 and nine. 10 and nine, yeah, something like that. So you've, you've both got good amounts of experience in the UFC. Obviously, he's got a bit more. He's been around a bit longer, but it's not, it's not something that's going to be like the big difference maker. Do you know what I mean? No, no. You know, I, you know after you know, the first initial you know, kind of comment thread was, you know, this is a random matchup. Like, mm -hmm. who's Morona? Why Morona? And then after you know, people started turning the wheels, a lot of the guys were like, you know what? This is a fight. I didn't know 
I wanted to see, but now I'm interested. And, and, and yeah, man, I, I am a veteran. I feel like a veteran. And, uh, and I know, you know, that you don't get guys more, more experienced than Pettis. And I think this is going to be a, a really cool high level fight. And, uh, and mm-hmm. again, this is my first like true, high, like everything in the UFC is high level, but you know, Pettis is, is, is the, the high level of the high level. And I always tell a lot of my fighters at home, I'm like, there's no motivation, like UFC motivation. Like when I got word of my debut, I had 12 days to prepare and I had never worked so hard in a, in a, in a fire, you know, like a fireball fight camp is what I call them, like condensed fight camps. When I got word of this Pettis fight, you know, I heard about it in the middle of teaching a kid's class and was like excited. I was like, whoa, this and that. And before that class had ended, ESPN had posted it. So I went from like being excited and being in that kind of like, you know, hazy state, you know, that, that's a real state. And I was like, Oh, it's, it's legit. This guy's my opponent. You know, he's going to try to damage me and I'm going to damage him. I am no longer a fan. I have a lot of respect, but you know, this guy is enemy number one and uh, my mindset changed like that. Then certainly after the fight, we'll go back to, to being, uh, you know, as respectful as possible. But, but this is a, um, you know, you know, some people are like, you know, are you getting starstruck? I'm like, hell no. Maybe my first, my first UFC fight card, was when Robbie Lawler fought Carlos Condit, and you know I got to meet Stipe and Andre Olovsky, and it, it was cool. But uh, ever since then, I was like, you know, these guys are not—they're not my idols. This is my competition, mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 the mindset has certainly changed. Yeah, that's definitely how you got to look at it. I was watching um, uh, Anthony Pettis' interview with Errol Hawani earlier, and he was—they was talking, and I think Errol asked him like what what he felt like when he got offered like you. The, opportunity to fight you and he said um he understands like why he needs to accept fights like this because this is how people like you make your name because like you were just saying people will look at the fight to start with and say and say this is maybe not the best matchup but if you look into your background and look into your fights like we've we've already talked about you you've got your black belt in jiu-jitsu you're you're always there standing and banging and that's how you win most of your fights and you've got UFC experience. So there's nothing to do with this matchup. That's, that's odd. It's just going to be a great fight. It's just an underrated fight right now. But when it happens, I feel like it's going to be uh, one of the fight of the nights. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. I love when guys like fight of the night candidate and fight of the night's cool. Anytime. And I believe fighters are like, oh, I'm going for fight of the night. They have the mindset to, to, to potentially lose. Not that they're saying that, but uh, I'm going to go for a performance of the night bonus. And, uh, and in that attempt, if the fight of the night comes, awesome. But, uh, but, uh, but again, I'm not, I, I don't want this to be competitive. I, wanna, mm-hmm. I want this to be one-sided. And, like, and that's not coming from like a super cocky, I'm going to crush him state of mind. It's coming from a best decision-making possible state of mind. And, uh, and again, I, I feel like I'm up to the task. And I'm really excited to prove not only to the world but to myself that, uh, that, that I can, you know, stand and bang and, and trade and, and fight with the best of them. It'll be cool. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. one thing about Pettis, you know, I, I saw that he got sober. And, and I just wanted to say, man, I, I appreciate uh, when, when guys, especially with, who've already had success, can, can find faults and, and look to fix things. And, uh, you know, I was watching the interview with my coach, my, my, one of my best friends. He's been my coach. He started as a training partner uh, and is my striking coach now. Best pad holder in the world. But, you know, I was like, you know, I was like, coach, good for Pettis. Way to, way, to, way to make gains even so far down the road. So I was happy to hear that. It seems like he's in a good place. And, again, I just I want to fight the best Pettis that there's ever been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the reason why I say fight of the night, because while I was watching the interview of uh, Hawaiian, he was talking about the stuff that he's, he's just started going to the uh, sports psychologist and stuff like that and talking, getting more into the, the mindfulness and stuff like that. And it seemed like he's really found something in it and it seems like he's like renewed, renewed himself. So hopefully it's going to be, for you, hopefully it's going to be a performance of a night. For the fans, I'm saying it's going to be fight of the night because you both seem like you're, you're there ready and you both look, from men- mentally and physically from what I've seen, you both look like you're ready to fight. Hell yeah, cool, man. And, and again, like, you know, just doing this for the fans is cool. Mm-hmm. And like when I say for the fans, for myself as well, the only reason I ever started training was because I enjoyed watching the fights and then, you know, and, and I just enjoyed training so much that I would do it, uh, you know, a, a psychotic amount. And then after maybe six months, my first coach was like, you're in here all the time. Why don't you compete? <laughs> and I was like, coach, I don't really know what that means. Like, sh- show me the way. So I had my first kickboxing match about six months after training. And we had shin guards and headgear. And I kicked the guy in the head and knocked him out. 
And then I'm, I don't know how many jujitsu tournaments I did. And I was like a, a younger teenager. There were no teens divisions going against adults. And honestly, I got my ass kicked as a white and a blue belt quite a lot. But I, I got really good at like submission defense and, and like almost the Homer Simpson grappling strategy of like, you know, taking a lot of offense, defending, getting the guys tired, and then really pushing heavily in the later rounds. And, uh, and as a black belt now, naturally, I'm not getting, you know, throwing a bunch of subs on, but, but that, that defensive style comes alive when it needs to. And, uh, and it just a lot of the experience I had as a late teen and younger 20 year old has really started to pay dividends. Now that I'm 30, I truly feel like I'm in like my athletic prime. And, uh, and again, I've, I always feel like I've had a good mindset for fighting sometimes almost too aggressive. Like a good example is when I fought chaos, I should have been more patient, made better decisions, but I planted my feet and started bombing and that shit got out of hand quick and uh, and i'll and i've and i've learned that lesson and uh, and honestly it's been kind of a, a nice physical reminder you know he and i fought on the same card when i fought reese he's fighting on this card so every time i see him i'm like boom make better decisions it's just it's cool i like the reminders i like the you know i like that kind of stuff i like the pressure pressure's good if you don't work well under pressure in mma you're gonna have a, a good career and I, and I feel like i thrive under pressure yeah, yeah, I did notice that as well, that you was always on the same card as each other. <laughs> yeah, so it, odd coincidence, I'm sure. I'm not big on on, 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 on fade and, and, and everything, but it's just I take the lessons where I can get them. Yeah. yeah, and obviously in your last fight, like we spoke about a little bit, it was against uh, Reese McKee, which he had his first fight in the UFC against Kamzat on short notice. And obviously we all know he lost that fight. But then there's big things coming from him. And I've seen him come out and say that he was just like, a bit overzealous in that fight. How did you, how did you feel in that fight? Was it, was it more for you a fact of getting through that fight clean or was you there to bang? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if that makes no, sense. No, dude. I mean, we, we said the third, the third highest significant strikes landed in UFC history. Yeah. And uh, even after watching uh, the Davison Figueroa fight against Brandon Moreno, which was a banger, man, what a fight! Mm -hmm. They set a high pace, and even throughout five rounds, I, I had landed more more significant strikes than than, uh, than both guys. Which I was like, no way, that's awesome because those dudes were active and hitting hard. But no, I didn't. You know, obviously, I didn't want to take damage, but taking damage is a part of going to battle. Mm -hmm. So, like being extra con cautious of it was was not a thing. I was just doing my thing. And I, I'll tell you, I hope they throw reading Hamzat hard, very hard to do. You see what Hamzat's done. And then yeah, that was my 11th UFC fight. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm no rookie. Uh, I'm definitely in a walkover. And that was another tough fight for him as well. And, uh, and honestly, his chin was good. We had watched quite a bit of tape, you know, in the room as we had a lot of time to kill. <clears throat> and we'd watched some of his fights. And, and, and my coach was like, you know what, man, he's got a chin on him. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can hit harder than these dudes. And I cracked Reese with some shots. Mm -hmm. I've hit dudes with, with weaker punches that have put him down. And I cracked Reese with some big ones. And it didn't phase him. It didn't stun him. Didn't change his facial expression. So it was funny. Going into the third round of that fight, my head coach, safe, the general, a master, was like, Morono, this guy's in good shape. He's young and he's got a chin. He's like, stop trying to knock him out. He's like, be more technical. Mm -hmm. throw straight and, and land more and i was like you got it coach and uh and the advice was great but no reese has all my respect um and uh, and again i just I, I would love to see him fight in the ufc again uh, against uh, you know another guy with like less than five fights and i'd really like to see how he does yeah yeah he's definitely had a, a, a tough few, first two fights and obviously in that fight there was something that a lot of us have probably never seen before where he Got it. He lost his mouth guard down the side of the octagon, and you were stood there for I don't know how long, quite a while, just looking for the for the fingers. That ever happened to you before? No, you know, almost every interview you guys have asked. You know, <laughs> I've I've cornered a, a couple hundred fights. I've been to a couple hundred shows, and I've watched thousands of fights. I've never once seen that happen before. Closest thing I can say to that was one time a guy was walking out, and uh, he didn't have a cup. Or a jock strap. So they went, they ran to the back, found a cup, they had nothing to hold it in. So his corner duct taped it like onto his uh, onto his shorts, and the ref was like, This is ridiculous. And that cup falls out, I'm gonna disqualify him. And uh, and and that was that was more amateur prep, you know. The mouthpiece thing was just weird. Never mm -hmm. seen it before. It was really no one's fault. 
that one, we just kind of had to roll with the punches. And man, I had such a good flow going. I had such good rhythm and timing in that fight. Yeah. I actually didn't want that break, but I mean, it wasn't anyone's fault. No one had a choice. So it was kind of like, go with the flow and, and, and resume when you can resume. Mm -hmm. As I, I never thought a situation would come up where I'd think, like, would, why would you not bring a, a second mouth guard? But you'd never think you'd need it, would you? You know what? I bring a second mouth guard, but even my replacement mouth guard was in my bag in the room, yeah. not at the apex. So, I mean, you know, I'm going to at least have it in my bag this time, but. <laughs> it's a weird thing to stop a fight for a, for a moment. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, uh, one thing I've got to ask as well is where did you get your nickname, The Great White? Yeah, you know, before I got the Great White uh, moniker, they used to call me Baby Fedor, which was cool. I was kind of like baby faced, <laughs> and I'd throw down. Not expressionless, though, but, man, I wish I knew the details. If I had known the name was going to stick, I would have uh, paid attention anyway. So, like, there's a Saturday hard sparring session at my gym. We, we grapple hard, then we spar hard. In this, this particular session, there weren't a lot of MMA guys there, but there were some boxers. There was one of my buddies, Mexican dude, like classic, tough Mexican boxer. His name, his name was Peanut. <laughs> and, uh, and none of these guys were in, like, great shape. And I, I, It was him and, like, two or three other dudes – and we do a shark tank drill. And I, I had been fighting very actively, so I was already in shape. So we're doing the Saturday hard sparring, and every round I get a new partner. But I was already in shape. These dudes weren't. And, uh, and so I was, like, putting the pace on them, you know, really landing some good punches. So I was being, like, really aggressive in a drill where you're just kind of meant to survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it was a shark tank drill. I was getting aggressive. And, uh, and I remember I had my shirt off, and it was in the summer, and I had a pretty wicked farmer's tan. So I used to work for my dad's company doing like groundwork labor for leveling ground for pools mm -hmm. so i'd be super sunburned on my arms and head but but i had a farmer's tan so like my my body was like ghostly yeah. white and just like the mixture of the shark tank drill the aggression and and me being pale as a ghost uh peanut my boy was like man you the great white in the shark tank drill it was pretty funny and uh and i and, and you, know, I, you know you don't really choose your fight nicknames but that one stuck and uh and you know i've just kind of like lived by it ever since and uh, and, I, and i like it because it shows like a sign of aggression in fights and, uh, and, you know, so that kind of goes with, uh, with the state of mind when I'm fighting. Yeah. No, I think it suits the, your fight style because like, when you watch you fight, it's the great white. You're just like hunting. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in the past, I used to have a, I didn't have the best finishing instincts. Like I'd hurt guys and not know it. But thankfully, thankfully, I feel like I've gotten much better at that, especially as a pro. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, can you give us a prediction for your fight with Pettis? Yeah, I mean, so I say this in every interview, just because uh, I, you know, it, it it saves, it just it just helps. I'm always looking for a knockout, always. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, instead of looking for any one finish, uh, you know, doing damage, I have 15 minutes to take as little damage and give as much damage as possible. So I got 15 minutes to, to do as much damage, and it's irrelevant against two. It's my opponent at the time, but uh, but I I expect to maximize damage output in the 15 minutes a lot. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm getting paid for. That's what I'm going to do. Nice. Give the fans uh, something to watch. That's right. <laughs> and obviously, if you get through this fight and everything goes pla as planned, where do you see yourself? Uh, like, What sort of opponent do you see next? Are you looking for like a top 10, top 15? You know, that's what I believe is the real silver lining to getting this fight. And again, like celebrating the matchup is, is the wrong move. It's celebrating the victory. Mm -hmm. So primary mindset is on winning this fight. And with a win, it opens up the possibilities for everything literally a matchup against anybody and it just elevates me to that high level so you know that's it, it's not really the who but the what and uh and that's what's most motivating for me yeah yeah definitely i, I love the, the mindset you have towards this fight as well it's, it's great not that you're, it's good that you're not just looking at it as like you said it's not just the you're not celebrating the matchup because it's you've got him and you've that's going to move you so far forward you need to focus right. on that now, here and now, and then get that past now. Yeah, you know, I was, it was funny. I was thinking that, and then our, our final sparring session before we flew out, my coach from Dallas, he said what I was thinking, and I was like, awesome. It's nice to hear such a high-level guy, you know, say the same thing that I was already thinking. So, no, yeah, that's, you know, I, I have the task at hand. Yeah. That's, and that's where it really counts. That's, that's another thing, is having the people around you to reinforce that mentality and what you're thinking is also – not only good for you, but good for them because when it all works, you you, are, you all get better together. So, cool. Yes, sir. That's right. Yeah. So that's all the questions I've got for you today, Alex. Uh, I wish you the best of luck on Saturday.
Cool, my man. Thank you. This was fun, man. Enjoy the fights. Yeah, I will do. You too. Cool. I'll catch you later. See you later, man.